かるHi, this is Greg Hildebrandt. I've been a professional artist for 62 years. I've done a lot of artwork in that time, and I'm still just trying to get it right. Hello, Mr. Hildebrandt. Keith, here we are again. We're back. It Finally. Is, what, after a month or so? Yeah, yeah. We were trying to get it right all that while. And <laughs> Practicing. <laughs> Practicing, yeah. No, we took some time off. Uh, had some different things going on, different big projects that took up yeah. a lot of time. And, yeah, it just uh, ended up that way, you know. That's how things go. But yeah, we've got some people already jumping back in. Hi, people. Yeah, you know, we didn't know if anybody would show up. So, <laughs> thanks. We really appreciate it. You don't want to be a stranger in a strange land, exactly. I mean, uh, or do we? No. Not really. No, because no, it's our own land. That's true. Oh, it's your land. I don't well, know for the ride. But, you, but, you, but the, you, you feel like a stranger and a lot of times. I do anyway. You know, it's like... Yeah. It, yeah. Particularly when I'm around people. Yeah, exactly. That causes <laughs> the problems. <laughs> Actually, when we're on the easel or on the drawing board, then, you know, now you're, you're in your own land. Yeah. And, and exploring and having fun there. I probably feel like a stranger there, too. Lost. Yeah. Lost in the white space. Yeah. So can, you know, hey, if anybody wants to chime in and say hello, we really want to hear from people today. Let us know if we can hear you or you can hear us. This yeah, is, I can't hear you no matter what. But um, This little band-aid is from a, a finger cut that I got packing some cardboard to get out for recycle. Slicing myself on a piece of cardboard. Yeah. Mortally wounded. Yes. Fortunately, it was not on, you know, the, the drawing and painting fingers. Yeah. Just like but anyway, this behind me is a painting that I'm working on presently is a centerfold for an upcoming next year to 2023. 23. Uh, Lord of the Rings calendar that we're doing with Heavy Metal magazine. And this will be a centerfold painting for that calendar, which combines Tarn of the Warrior from Heavy Metal, their iconic figure from their 81 film and, and onward, and uh, a creation of my own as though from the medieval dark world, you know? And uh, so they're bad, they're about to, to do battle. And so I've been having fun with this. Cool, thanks for letting us know. So again, oh man, I'm tearing up the joint. Yeah, uh, those are T square. T square and a horse. T square and a model horse, I use all these. Here, let me see. Like the, I use these figures. There's a whole bunch of them over here. Grab that T-Rex. I'll take these things. The, they're very useful for combining it. Uh, I'll like them and use various parts, you know, legs and texture to get the lighting on the anatomy on, on when I'm doing a creature. Or sometimes I'll, uh, I have in the past made an entire creature out of clay, sculpted. But here, these things work very well, you know? Yeah. Three-dimensional, right? Right. So again, anybody has any questions, comments, constructive criticisms, you name it, please, by all means, shoot us a line, let us know, we'll try to answer anything we possibly can. So, uh, Greg, today's topic, you know, we were discussing, you know, hey, what do we want to talk about the comeback show? In the past, we had talked about, you know, art as propaganda and these different fields, and you know, we're thinking of the holiday spirit, and I used Santa Claus in the little in the, in the graphic we put out. But you know, we didn't want to go, you know, the religious root of of, of the holiday. Um, 
But one thing, you know, that we kind of landed on was the fact that, uh, now I can only speak for North America, I can't speak for, uh, for the rest of the world, uh, sorry, I'm just not that well versed, but that the, the Christmas time, right, all of, of the arts come together, right, across the board in like every medium and really unite everybody in one kind kind of mood. Now, again, we're not talking about the religious aspects of things, you know. We're that does, you know, plus all stuff like the uh, uh, Gene Shepherd's A Christmas Story. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, you name something. It's like it's a uniting uh, a, a, a piece of artwork. People get off all their crap. Hopefully, and I think a lot of it well, it does work, and come together and can be, what, entertained, inspired. Yes, and I mean, it, it's the the one time that you truly see all of the arts with the same goal, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have the the Nutcracker Ballet that's performed everywhere yeah right it's performed everywhere on the radio and everywhere it is specifically you know christmas tunes mm -hmm. you know right the visual art world you see you know from advertisements or whatever that classic illustration uh from the coca-cola santa you know, yeah sunblown having sunblown thank you very great much. illustrator fantastic, fantastic. Illustrator. <laughs> uh but it, it's everywhere and then you know Film, animation, rock and roll, the Trans Siberian Orchestra, all of it is united and really kind of helps sell, you know, this, this spirit of togetherness, of oneness, of, of, the, ho of the holidays, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, people even get into it on a very individual level. You know, with decorating their homes. And, That's right. And it becomes a, a expression of personal expression, creative expression. Yeah. For a lot of people, many people. And the the overall or overwhelming feeling or spirit of it, like I said, you know, is a oneness, is of a a giving right. spirit. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, You know, we see it a little bit with Halloween, you know, but, right. but Halloween I, doesn't have that the same no, Im no. impact. Uh, but, you know, as, as we were talking about this, we started talking about some other areas. Like you brought up comic conventions. <laughs> well, I think yeah, this whole genre, I mean, the first time I was aware of that was Gene had set up a show. We just started working together. Was it 1980, I think? And one of the big malls here in New Jersey of an art show. And it came at wintertime, and at near Christmas time, and it was a huge show. She said it. She organized the whole thing, and it, there, there was we, we went and set it, helped set it all up, and then a blizzard started, and it was this huge blizzard. I mean, we figured, well, the show's dead. This is it. Nobody's coming. Gradually, the place started to fill up. More and more people came. And they were pulled through this, and the thing that got me, I'm standing back there watching this whole, all these different people from all these different walks of life uh, with the, one of the guards. And he's like standing there shaking his head, saying, I've never seen this. And I said, what? He said, all these different ki kinds of people coming together for one thing. It, it, you know, you motorcycle people, people from the inner city, you know, racially, religious-wise, middle class, upper middle class, kids, adults, old people all coming together to, you know, well, what, dig this kind of art form. And it and it's like it hit me. that That's the first time I really saw it graphically on how this stuff really pulls all kinds of people together. And you go to Comic-Con, so the same thing. Yeah. You know, politically, I mean, on the outside of that sphere, everybody's got their own individual thing, and they could be at odds with one another these days, yeah. especially more than ever, seemingly. And yet when they're under this, in the, inside this bubble, all that stuff stops. 
and there's this kind of like unifying uh, thing that happens. And, and for that and for Christmas at this time, for yeah. the arts, and that's the objective. I think the objective is with art is to do that, to inspire, to pull people together, to have them, you know, go to another level, you know, hopefully a higher level. Yeah. You know? But unfor unfortunately, it doesn't do that a whole lot. Well, you know, I think a lot of it is what? Is is that the intent of the artist? Or is, is, or is it just not working these days? Or maybe it's, you know, it has worked on and off for certain people at certain times in history. Yeah, and you see it, you know, work to degrees. But, like, if you, you know, like think about going to a museum, you know. People go into it in a, a museum, but they typically admire on their own. It's even though you're there with other people. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's not a shared experience. No, not at all. And it's dead silent, too. It's yeah. almost like they've gone into a church, and you can't talk. And if you say stuff, I remember I, I'd go to museums, you know, to the Met or whatever, and start raving about something, and people look at you like, shh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of weird. Yeah. But, no, you're right. It, it, it isn't necessarily a unifying event, the, the trip to the museum. And, it's very much an individual thing. Yeah, I mean, like, when you go to a rock concert or something like that. Oh, yeah. Everybody leaves everything behind, and they're, they're joining that. But it's it's a it's a brief moment. Mm -hmm. It's a one night, right? Shot, uh, you know, in different cities and, and, and whatnot. But you, we, you know, with the comic cons, and with Christmas, <laughs> we see that it can be held over an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Now. You know, you think like Christmas. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of a lot of it is commercially driven, totally, right? Yeah. But at the same time, that's the spirit of it isn't commercially driven. Mm -hmm. You know, the act of buying a gift from someone. Yeah, someone's trying to sell you something. I mean, we try to sell people things. Sure, it's we just do. it's it's the nature of commerce and business and all that. It's inherently not a bad thing. Uh, but people going out buying a gift for someone, you know, because they want to give it, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's, that, that's the, the, well, the whole idea is that, everything. yeah, the spirit of giving, I mean, isn't that what, what it's yeah. supposed to be all about as opposed to just receiving? Yeah. And, but it, it, it really is the, the, the art that creates that atmosphere. And again, I want to jump over to the Comic Con, right? Again, you know, San Diego's over four or five days now. New York's over four or five days. And everyone, you know, comes in. And again, you know, from cons 20 years ago or whatnot, 30 years ago, little rinky dink things. Mm -hmm. The uh, bottom of a church. Yeah, yeah. New York, you go to the bottom of the church uh, or some other hotel lobby, mm -hmm. you know. And go around and you know you meet but they've become these events and it's no longer just about these major companies that are going there and showing off their art and showing off their artists and things like that uh, the attendees have kind of taken ownership and all of them dress up now everybody dresses up mm -hmm. and they I mean they're dressing as their favorite characters but they've created this camaraderie and this bond that happens within the context mm -hmm. of the show. Yep. You know? Like, right. And on the outside, they go out and they're, they're the stranger in the strange land. Yeah. They're looked at as the freaks. People put them down. A lot of these people who get into that kind of a, into that world, call them weirdos and God knows what, you know? And it's becoming much more accepted nowadays, right? Just because, mm -hmm. I mean, I think maybe with those Marvel movies, they've gone yeah. so far into the into the pop culture yeah. zeitgeist of like everyday life, um, that people are starting to accept it. Where it wasn't like, oh, man, look at that weirdo dressed <laughs> dressed up. Yeah. Um, so, well, 
let's throw this out to the people. Get a few people commenting and talking. You know, oh yes, Merry Christmas, and Happy Holidays to you as well, Elijah. Star Wars timeline. I believe that is the person you just did yes. the interview with. How are you doing? Great to see you. Thank you for joining in. Um, hello from Scotland. The painting's beautiful. Thanks a lot. <laughs> It should be done in about another five or six days, I think. I hope to finish it by tomorrow, but I, I can see that I'm not, you know. So I have a question from for the person from Scotland. You know, I, I made the comment earlier that I can only comment uh, for, you know, the United States and, you know, Canada gets in on it. I'm not too sure about Mexico, even though I made the mistake it's in North America. Uh, around this holiday time, is it? Do you find the arts in Scotland are unifying everything, or is it just not a big deal, uh, you know, there? I have no idea. So if you want to pipe in and let me know your thoughts and opinions on that, I would truly appreciate it. And As an artist, you, know, you always hope to make some kind of a dent like that, that you want to do more good than bad with your artwork. You want to yeah. create more what? Less animosity. Uh, you want to put, You do want to inspire people. You do want to turn people on. You do want them to be happy, feel, you know, good over what you do, and have them all come together and get off their respective crap. You know, in terms of the hate that goes on. I mean, so much right now that's going on all around the place. And you know, you know, as an artist, though, you know, you always question that yourself. You know, what the hell is this valuable? Is it doing anything? And when people let you know that it is, man, that's a great feeling. Just as, the, you know what I mean, as yeah. a creator, right? Yeah. That you know you're having a, an impact. And, and when you go down and think, well, what's the use of this? There's no value to it. What big deal? I, you know, I'm making a living and I'm enjoying it, but what real good is it? Well, the film that Gene and I just looked at, The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne, holy mackerel. There, there's a couple of, with, with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, there's a couple of, uh, it's about an artist who is, uh, you know, uh, I never heard of um, until I saw the film. I, I think I've seen some of his paintings in the past, but it's such a positive film about art and the impact and the possibility that art has on the world of what it can do. I mean, I'd recommend it to everybody to see this film. It's just to get, there's a couple of times, there's a couple of talks and there's there pieces of dialogue that really deliver that, you know, that whole idea of the impact of art. And, and, and and where can we see it? Well, it's, it's on, where the heck is it? I think it's on Amazon, I think. Okay. Yeah. It's just with, uh, like I said, Cumberbatch, and he's incredible in the film. Well, everybody is in the film, but it's a beautifully made movie. It's just and, fantastic. And what is the name, one more time? The Electrical Life of Lewis Wayne, W-A-I-N. So, you know, the one thing, you know, just kind of going down this bunny trail as I'm formulating thoughts on this idea, uh, yeah, art, typically, or, you know, from the visual arts or whatever, is usually a, a reflection of oneself or a statement about something or when you're doing a commercial job and they're trying to <clears throat> sell yeah. something or do something. Um, so do you, do you think that in order for something to then be widespread, long-lasting, almost universal. Does it have to be multiple artists joining in with the same, relatively same vision and purpose? Or could, it, could we see some kind of rise up and unification through the arts while everybody is still doing their own it's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel about it? What do you think? I don't know. This is just kind of coming to me as I'm. Yeah, as you know, we don't come into the, we don't come into these things with a whole lot. No, we just start talking. We just start just... talking, and it goes where we go. Um, and because I just enjoy having conversations with you, I don't want to have rehearsed. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but. Uh, We do see the greatest impact when all of the arts are working on a very similar. When you say all of the arts working on a similar vision, you know, what do you what exactly? What? Uh, again, where, well, just 
at this idea of Christmas, not not the birth of Jesus, not the, even though Christmas is that's well that's is a celebrated day mm-hmm. of the uh, of the religious holiday, right? It's it's grown beyond that here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say a majority of the people that are celebrating Christmas in this country at this particular moment in time aren't really celebrating the birth of Jesus. Now, they might be doing it through tradition. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. And that's kind of a shame because that gets lost about it. Well, in this world, too, I think a lot of people have abandoned, though they claim to be Christians, they have nothing to do with the words and the, and the directions, directives of Jesus Christ. I mean, yeah. when you go to the, we've talked about this before, I think, when we go to the so-called Sermon on the Mount, where the Beatitudes are given, when yeah. you look at all that, how many people are practicing that today? You know, it's a shame. You know, if you're really going <laughs> to celebrate the birth of Christ, you really got to get into it and be real about it and, yes. and, and look at it, not invent it for yourself of what it means. Yeah. Not to say, you know, thou shalt not kill, but I can go out and kill this person because of this and this and this, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Either either those ideas and admonitions and beliefs and teachings are there, and you're going to follow them, or you ain't. You know? Yeah. It, it's, it's, I, I don't know. But it, it, what I'm saying is it's a shame that that gets lost is was kind of smeared over and forgotten or transformed or lied about and reinvented to make it fit your prejudices. Yes, or your personal biases. Your, your yeah. personal biases. Uh, now, to, to make things clear or, uh, or clarify here, uh, when you say it's a shame that it has gotten lost, well, it's probably been lost from the beginning. I was, yeah, was, yeah. I'm not saying that it's just going on right now. The centuries, will, all you got to do is get, get some truthful, honest history books, and it'll tell you of how it's been lost. I mean, there's no two ways about it. I mean, you know? Yes. But <laughs> so what are we still here? You're not suggesting that uh, people need to turn back to the worship of a deity. No, no, not at all. No, 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 no. What you're saying is the... Uh, the, the lessons that the lessons that, that are there, the, the, the golden taught, rule, you know. yeah, the golden rule, which has existed before Christ, right? Do yeah. unto others as you would have with others do yes. unto you. In that magnificent painting that Norman Rockwell did, yes. that that makes that statement. You know, yep. there it is, right there. That you, all right, that may seem self-serving. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, yeah. But then Christ, what did Christ go and say? You know, love your neighbor as yourself. Yep. All that, all those teachings, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not saying you should return <clears throat> yeah. to a, a religion. No. No, I'm not saying that. But returning to the context of uh, what the guy said. Yeah, 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 the, the <laughs> message, the, t- the actual the, the, message. The thought. Yes. So, to to then my, my point, most of what we're doing is somehow related to either Santa Claus... Santa Claus gift is, giving is, yeah, family, right? And that's all cool. It's, it's fun. It's fantasy. Yeah, it appeals to my imagination. I love yeah. it on that level. You know, it's a fairy tale. It's like you know, yeah. it's fun. Myth, yeah. magic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I think that's the stuff that everybody kind of can get on board with, recognizing that okay, Santa Claus is not kids watching. Santa Claus is not real. He's a, there's a spirit of Santa Claus, right? right. I, I like to embody the spirit of Santa Claus, right? right? But, but, you know, sure. Um, I think that's what people get into mm-hmm. and buy into and really yeah. grab a hold of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Uh, <clears throat> and so saying that all of the arts working in that common vision, they're all selling the same similar uh, imagery, mm-hmm. very similar uh, messages, ideals that center around this time right. frame. Right, right. You know? Trans Siberian Orchestra, you know, it's right. the, the Christmas Eve, you know, the day before the magic hour, you know. Yeah, uh, right. Well, that's much more gear. There's no Santa Claus in the, the TSO. Yeah, no. not, not, none of that. It's all the, you know, it is the birth of Christ, and it, it's, but it's not in that, it's not in this, uh, what can I say? What's the word to use? Not to offend too many people. Sappy, saccharine. There's none of that crap. No. It's, it's a hardcore message. It's basically 
uh, you know, against all those things that we're talking about, anti-war. I mean, with the original song that they did, you know, Christmas Eve Sarajevo, which was inspired by the, uh, the cello player that went out to the second war in Sarajevo and played Christmas music in the midst of, of this battle, you know, mm -hmm. and that turned them on. And there it becomes this statement, you know, that that's the core of the, of the whole of TSO is that, you know. Is the, 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 to be this and act this in the midst of all this hideousness that's going on all around us, you know? Yeah. So, you know, again, when we start thinking about this, my initial thought was wondering, you know, does even, even the, the, the Christmas in this country specifically has drifted away from the very traditional religious mm -hmm. Aspect, mm -hmm. um, you know, does does there need to be at some point some centralized <laughs> religion that can do? I don't know. That gets into a whole other world. Of, uh, I was wondering that, but then we started thinking about. I don't want to see any new re more religions. No, there's no, enough no, religions no. in our world. Religions. Can I have you for exactly two minutes? Can you leave this for two minutes? I need you to sign something for UPS. I've got to Sorry, go sign guys. something for UPS. Talk to Keith. Keith, Keith loves Keith you. Keith talks to me. Keith loves you. Great. How are we doing? Answer some questions. Do we have any? No. <laughs> Other than this awesome painting. Uh, and then when Greg comes back, I'll go on with my thoughts about do we need the religion to be the central figure? And thinking, no, that's what the comic book convention teaches us. Uh, as long as there is a centralized vision. But anyway, does anyone have any questions for me? Is anyone still watching? Yes, a few people. Thank you. Hi, Tim. How you doing? Thank you for joining in. Thank you for commenting and watching as I sit here and wallow away the time or whatever. Just kind of make stuff up. How about this painting? <laughs> Gene stole Greg. He's my counterpart. But I'll move out of the way so everybody can see this. Anybody have any questions about this? Right? Loves all the drama in the background between the light and the dark sky. Absolutely. And Greg was pointing out earlier when we were talking that we have the, the good side over here that is represented in the light and the bright colors going against the darkness. And then symbolically we have the, the dark character over here, the evil figure represented up against much lighter background to help that contrast and balance of the good and the evil. So that is some of the more subtle context of that painting. Yeah. Gene needed some signatures to get out for, to you. for UPS. UPS. And they are showing up uh, at any time now. So right. we are in the middle of a business day. So business has to go on. Business is business. Business right. is usual. What the hell were we talking about? Before? Well, <laughs> I said, I think, does the, the, I said, do we need at some, somewhere, does there need to be some kind of grain of religion? And you're like, oh, we don't need any more religions. Well, we don't. I mean, religion is invented by men, you know, and, and basically, uh, the, the, well, look, 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 look. Proof of the pudding is in the tasting, as they say yeah. in England. Uh, uh, what has it wrought in our world? What has religion wrought? I mean, it's real, real, it brought a lot of good for sure. But yeah. look at the comb combative nature of it these days, even in our country, to say nothing of a global you know, co conflict and how people use other people's religions to beat them down, yeah. to, to, to make monsters and villains out of them. And, and create the tension and conflict and war and murder and mass murder uh, in the name of their respective gods. I yeah. mean, uh, yeah. this is this is beyond. This. I mean, here we are. How long has the human race been here? We can't get beyond this. We can't get beyond this. We can't. We can't improve our lot. We, we we've made all this technological leap, so we can't do it ethically, morally. We're as deplete as we ever been, in, in a sense. I mean, we are. Yeah. We are. I mean, it's it's like, so I don't know about religion, but a, a, a belief. I mean, if you take the Ten Commandments, yes, they, they were, they, they've been written down years ago. If, if, if you take the Christ, the birth of Christ we're talking about here, the teachings, they're the, if, if the people were truly to follow that, they, it would be, it, there, there would be a transformation. 
in the world. Yes. You know? Yeah. They, they, there's no two ways about it. But I mean, it's like it, what they make of it now is they use it to kill each other. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be a lot of like when you of ownership of the words. There doesn't seem to be a lot of ownership it's all of the hypocrisy. words. It's all yeah. word service. It's all don't don't give me words. What are your actions like? Yeah. What do you do? How are you in the world? What kind of a person are you? What kind of a human being are you? How kind are you? How generous are you? You know, it's it, these are the questions. Yeah, and of course, I mean, of course, there are people out there. Uh, yeah, there that one hundred percent embody. Oh, they are. Uh, you know, like I, I think I've actually mentioned this guy to you, Peter, a guy I used to work with. Yeah, a pure embodiment of the spirit. Guy's phenomenal human being, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, his his actions back up back up his words, right? So so they're out there, but we're just not seeing it from the leaders. No, we're not. You know, and that what then we well, see from the leaders then trickles down to the followers. Yeah, it's it's not only that we don't see it in the leaders, we see it and I believe me, I'm the last one in the world to criticize the media. I believe me, I'm a part of it. And and I believe in a free press more just like you know, that's number one. But to constantly just put out bad news, you know there is good news in the world. People do do good. This this message should be put out also. You know, I know bad yeah. news attracts. It's like the accident. You know, we all no. rubberneck because of the crash on the side of the road. You yeah. know, but everybody but, has to look at a tragedy. E yeah, but yeah. there's good stuff in the world. There's great people in the world. This stuff should be constantly looked at and reported. Also, you know, I totally agree. To, at least equally, you know, okay. to the negative. Okay, we got some other questions. Want to switch topics a little bit? Let's switch them. All right. Okay, so first I'm going to address Tom Hewitt uh, about the commission list any shorter. Tom, email Gene, J-E-A-N, at spiderwebart.com. You see that down there on the left. She will be able to answer all of your questions regarding Greg's commission list. She knows it better than he knows it. I Trust me. I just follow <laughs> orders. I'm a good soldier. I salute. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Trust me. She does a great job of organizing everything and making sure that everything operates and runs, as you can see, right now to make sure that the UPS gets out. Yes. You know? She handles everything. I mean, when I say everything, I mean everything. Everything. Okay. And then some person says, is there anything that you would consider magic during the creative process? However you would define it. Feelings, inspiration, etc. The whole thing is magic. The, the, fact, yeah. the fact that I'm still doing it at 83 is is magic to me. The fact that I'm still doing it and people like it and I'm able to pull it off, you know, to, to sit there and invent and fill up that wet piece of paper with a drawing and then to move to this point is the whole process is magical. If you want to look at it that way. I, you know, for me personally, I would say the observation of what a lot of other people have done, uh, I would consider magic more than anything that I would do myself. Well, we all feel that, of <laughs> yeah. course. But, uh... No, the, the very process, the, the fact that you're able to do it, the very yeah. fact that we're walking around and talking right now and not even doing it, moving our hand. I used to, I think maybe we've all done it. I know as a little kid, I was really aware of it. Like I'd be laying in bed, all of a sudden I'd wake up and I'd look at my hand and move. So I'm like, hi, I can move this. <laughs> and there's no strings going anywhere. I'm not like I'm not Pinocchio. It's yeah. like I'm self animated. Yeah. And and, and, I, and I think thoughts and, and I and I can you know and I can do all this stuff and the people can, around me can do all this stuff and we're all you know we're all walking around. Look at this. I mean that that kind of like intense feeling realization. Yeah. It, uh, it's magic. Well, the fact that you're a collection of atoms that has existed. Yeah. yeah. Since the dawn of well, all organized. All organized to form organized. all these all these these textures and, and soft to hard to <laughs> to, to the point that you could actually then think about and consider yourself right. I think You're a collection I of atoms that have always existed mm -hmm. that can has stopped for right. a moment in time to consider yourself and have all these emotions and okay. thoughts. And feelings or you're truly and a little you're a spongy organ encased in a skull. <laughs> And it walks around and meets. That's magic. That's magic. Yes, absolutely. It's magic. Well, even the fact this, 
you know, more practical. The fact that you can smear plastic. Right. A piece of cloth. On a piece of cloth and make it look like something that could exist in space. Or that it looks like something that we can all actually recognize. I mean, that's creating an illusion, right? Like you say, though, I look at the other artists that I admire and yeah. think they are really pulling it off. They're the magicians. Yeah. I'm not. I'm, yeah. I'm just a kind of like a sorcerer's apprentice. You know yes. what I mean? Con man. <laughs> Con man, yeah. <laughs> Waiting to be found out. You know? Well, yes. you do, I think, right? So when you look at the history of art, you look at the great artists that are yeah. either presently working or throughout yeah. time. Oh, my God. Yeah, That's absolutely. Incredible. Did Greg teach at the Kubert School? Yes, I did. And what yeah. did you teach, and what advice did he find the most helpful to his young students? What advice? What the hell? I mean, it's always the same thing. I think never give up, never quit. And, and if you think you've done it good enough, it's never good enough. It's never, ever. You never achieve the, that which you think that you you hope to achieve. It, or don't, don't ever be satisfied. I mean, it, it's like you have to keep constantly going over one mountain you you think you've gone as far as you can go you have to go further and further and further and further and just don't quit and don't listen to people tell you when it's wrong don't don't uh don't uh, that feeling that you may have uh, which i still have have it all the time i think all of us do that it's nothing that, what is this? this is a piece of crap you know don't quit the issue is don't quit don't do ne never stop you know it's the, the thomas Hart benton quote i like it that you know if you quit is when you fail there's no such thing. The Benton said, "There's no such thing as failure. Failure in the pursuit of art, merely to survive in that pursuit, is a success. The only time an artist can personally fail is if he or she quits working. So, that's what I give students. I mean, don't, don't think, and don't ever compare yourself with anybody. Never look at, oh, look at so and so over there, how good they are, and my stuff is crap. That's all part of this same kind of conversation. Don't compare yourself. You know, be inspired by what other people do." So don't, don't beat yourself into the ground with it. Uh, so you say to, to never be satisfied. So if I'm working on a piece of art and I embody that never being satisfied, how do I know when to say when and when to move on? Well, fortunately, I have a gene that tells me when the painting is done. <laughs> so she could say, that's, stop it, it's over with, or you gotta, you got to tickle over here, this over here is fixed, this, this, this eye isn't right. So, but no, I, I'm saying... Well, it's kind of an interesting conversation for me. I mean, while I'm working on something like this, I'm turned on and excited about it. You, you, you're, you're pushing yourself into it further and further and further. And then finally it gets to a point for me, I'm, I'm sure it will, and it'll be all over with. And I'll look at it, I'll say, eh, I don't know. Well, it's all right. I mean, and I'll go through my mind. You know, I'll go through the steps. I think we talked about this. What comp is the composition? Are you satisfied with the composition? Yes. The positioning of the elements, key, the primary center of interest, the secondary center of interest, the way the movement, the composition, the way this thing works in a circle, it works in a triangle, and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, that's satisfactory. Then I'll look, well, how's the drawing? All the basic, yeah, that's okay. Uh, the lighting and the color, yeah, that's okay. And then I'll get to the end, I'll say, but still, it just never made it. Now, it's always some vague thing that it never really makes it to to the paramount, you know what I mean, to the peak that it, I think it could have been. And I, and I used to, you know, get frustrated with that and, and, and really say, oh, right, throw it away. And, and, and now it now I just, that's just part of the process. That's all. And it's the carrot that's constantly dangling out in front that I'm pursuing that intellectually I know I'll never get, but I'm still uh, obsessively, you know, compelled yeah. to try to attain it. And then, for on a more practical level, you focused a lot on uh, lighting, right? When you were yeah. teaching lighting, the thing broke down. I, I had a, I, the first year I taught, I taught this broad course. You know, Joe Kubert said, you know, teach anything you want. I said, okay, well, illustration. You know, oh wow, what the hell is that? Illustration. I mean, so the first year students, I had them read. I picked a book by Edgar Rice Burroughs. It's at the Earth's core, about Pellucidar, the world inside the Earth, and it has everything in there. You know, it's got it's got the the action hero, it's got the machine that bores into the Earth, it's got dinosaurs, it's got creatures, it's got beautiful women, it's got everything that a young guy would want. Most of these were all young guys at the school, so 
all right. I said, no, now pick a cover to do a cover. Read the book, go through the book, and pick the right scene for the cover. After I talked to them that you got to find a scene in the book somewhere that really grabs attention on the bookshelf. I'd, I'd, give, a, I'd give a talk initially about that, that you've got like three seconds to grab a viewer when the book is in the bookstore because you've got so many other books on the shelf that cover's got to bang out. So pick something in the book. And so they all, they all did their layouts. They read the books and they did their layouts, their roughs. So then I suddenly start to realize, oh my God, I'll take them to the painting now. And there was like 25 guys in the, in the class. And, the, and each person picked a different scene out. Some of it were similar. And now I had to give them an explanation of how to work the lighting and the, and the colors to mix up. And it was almost impossible to mix, you know what I mean, to go through each individual in each painting and give the whole lighting setup on something like this, to give them the color breakdowns that I use and how to achieve it. And, and I only really could focus on a few of the people in the class at that time. So the next year, Gene and I analyzed it, what we could do, and I more or less landed. I, I have a, a, a project. That I had six months of art school way back in the 50s when I, before I started at my career. And one of the classes was color and design. And in that class, Bill Meinzing, the teacher, had a problem of, he had a setup of a cone a cube and a ball against a white sweep. And the ball was red, the cone was yellow, and the, and, the, and the square was blue. So you got the primary colors against the white sweep. And so I, I figured, well, the next year I'm gonna teach that. And I'm gonna have the students do, uh, do that setup with a white light on, on the subject, do the same setup with a warm light, like a yellowy light on the subject, and do the same setup with a bluish light on the subject and show how each one of those colors, the primary colors in white, were affected by the colored light. That I was able to achieve in the class and do in a really doable manner. So that, that became the course. It became basically light in its impact on color, using just those those ob few objects to convey the thing. Not, you know, I wasn't concerned about drawing or anything at this point. Just, to, you know what I mean? So. That was the first semester of that particular year. The second semester now, I gave them two covers to do so that I knew the whole color breakdown, ones that I had done already. I gave them the choice to do a, a Dracula painting that I had already done for a book for Unicorn Publishing. So I, I knew all the colors that I used in that. And it was another scene from a fairy tale book of uh, Perseus and Andromeda and, and uh, you know, the dragon, you know, the sea creature. And that was in a warm light. The Dracula was in a cool light. The, the Perseus scene was in a warm light. So I gave them a choice, pick one or the other. So that most of them picked the Dracula scene. So I was able to accommodate that too. You know, with 20 people in the class, I was able to give them the color breakdown and work with them all. So, but I, worked, I put them through the whole thing of posing models like I do. I told them they had to get a camera. Most of the guys, they had never posed models. They were drawing out of their heads. I said, well, we're using models. And we're going to use photographs to go by. So I'd set that all up and we, 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 and we shot the models. And then they do their layouts. And, you know, I told them to come up with a composition that worked powerfully for the cover. And they couldn't copy my composition. They had to come up with their own. And uh, took them through the whole finished painting. And that was doable and that worked very well. So it's, that was the course that I taught. Cool. Hopefully that answered your question. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> So the, I'll add to that, and he's not asking my opinion, but I'm going to give it anyway. Um, my advice to young students uh, is find out what the point of the assignment is and do it. When you're in art school, art school is your time to work on your technique. It's the time to learn how the, ma uh, the materials work. Uh, what you are drawn to, what you like, what how different things work. Uh, I found a lot of students get hung up on, I want to do my own thing. <clears throat> I get that. I, I, I totally, oh, yeah, I totally get that. I want to do my own thing sure. too. Um, and it's great for you to do your own thing on your own time. When you are paying to be in a course, right? Mm -hmm. Um and 
presumably the person in front of you should know something about what they're talking about. And we all know that's not entirely the case, but we won't go there. Um, listen to what they have to say and actually attempt to do what they have to say. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's why you're in the class with the teacher. Yeah. You're, 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 because you don't know everything. But <laughs> well, you don't. <laughs> the teacher may not know everything either, but the chances are the teacher probably knows more, knows than, you more than you. Chances are. Yeah. Um, even if they're not a great teacher. Well, my, my, my course, too, I said, I, I think if I remember right, I begin the class with something like this is not dogma. What I'm going to tell you is not the only way that, to use light and color. It's the way I use it. I'm the teacher, and that's what I'm going to show you because that's what I know. Yeah. And that, that's kind of like what it came down to. And I, and I, and I got to say this, and I never praise myself too much sitting there over my panties, but I did a damn good job teaching because <laughs> the guys generally got it by the end of the year. Yeah. It went clunk. They got, they got what I was after. Yeah. Light and its impact on color. That this is where it comes down to. You put a blue light on something, it changes every color that you're, that is lighting. You put an orange light on something, that changes every color that you're lighting. Yeah. So and that went clunk, and that's what was important to me. So that concept registered, you know. Yeah. Very cool. Are there any other questions, comments, anything at all? Um, we got our comments list all covered up by about a zillion notifications that all of a sudden just started popping. What is that's that? kind of what I was in, going up in here. Uh, <laughs> this is the New Jersey patch. Well, we don't want. We don't, yeah, we don't want the patch. The patches. You get rid of that. <laughs> No bad news all the time. It's like how who killed who, and, yeah. and again, it's like. I mean, granted, I mean, news should of course tell you what what's happening in the real world, but more than the bad shit's happening, you know, good stuff is happening. Yeah, I mean, geez. yeah, you know, he, uh, you know, I saw two more questions pop up, which which we will uh, which we'll address, but you know, I, I'm right there with you, man. It's, something went wrong when uh, when the news or journalism had to make the switch to uh, for-profit businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, I was listening to NPR this morning, and they're talking about how uh, newspapers, uh, again, the I guess, or the, maybe the post office was subsidized in the early days to distribute newspapers, so people were able to break in in that business for almost no cost whatsoever mm -hmm. to be able to distribute information to people, mm -hmm. and that that led to the rising up of different uh, you know ideas and all that. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. go too deep into that story, but when every the news or, or journalism. Uh, which could still be found. You just have to look a little oh, harder yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it became entertainment media. Yeah. News entertainment. Right. It's the big ones. I mean, the big network shows yes. that everybody watches. And every, everybody, well, that's the look. key thing, too. Everybody watches. Yeah, that's what they all watch. You've chosen your political bent, and that's all you watch. You only watch that one point of view. And you take that as gospel, as though that's all real, not realizing that everybody has vested interest in yeah. pitching that message to you. Because they know you're going to buy it, you know what I mean, yeah. and you're going to, you know, hopefully buy the products that they're uh, that the commercial. Are. So that's the thing. I, I remember I, I worked with a man at, when I worked with Fulton J. Shane, who worked in Time Life, and he came to work for the bishop to do this magazine. Lou Orsini was his name. He was a fantastic human being. He said, you know, really being aware of that whole medium. He said, back then, I'm talking like the late '60s. He said, I, I read about 20 to 25 newspapers. He said, that's, that's at least you start to get, maybe you get a view of the truth. Yeah. You know, everything from the more liberal to the very conservative to religious, Christian Science Monitor, Village Voice, New York Times, what the hell ever, you know, all over the place. He would read all this stuff to, you know, to get a kind of like a view of something. Yeah, a vague idea of what's going What's on. happening, yeah. you know. It's, yeah. Yeah. So a joint effort in sharing a positive message yeah. is what really could bring the unification, you know? Yes. Uh, and it has to be a truly positive message, message yeah. not a right. Not a message of judgment. Right. Yeah. I don't know why people just can't get together. You know, it's yeah. like, I know that sounds cutesy and sweetsy in this day and age. If you start to talk that way, people will say you sound like really flaky or something. Yeah. There's got to be this 
brutal kind of like confrontational mentality that goes on. This like I don't know what that's about. What is that about? Does that prove that you're a man if you act that way? That you, you know, or what is that? What does that show? You know, I, I don't know. It, that it, it's just a whole. I don't know. There's there are definitely ways to be masculine, or manly, without needing to conquer. No, right. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Right. Or to, to impose your will upon right. somebody. Right. Yeah. Take over. Be a, like. A, yeah. I've never felt less of a man because I, you know. Let my wife be my wife. Exactly. <laughs> let, let her live her own life. Uh, so, exactly. All right. So, Greg, here's a good question. Uh, why do you use different signatures? And how do you choose the one that you're going to use? It's all arbitrary in the moment. There's no philosophical stand about it. I mean, I, I like signing a painting with a square because it reads better. And people can see, can, can read it. I think I think so yeah. if you get into a script, sometimes it gets lost. You can what the hell is that? You know how many yeah. times people sign, right? I mean, people go get autographs, and, they, and a guy will sign his name, or a guy will sign their name. You can't even read what that what it is. You don't even know who it is. Somebody's got to explain. Well, that's so and so signature. Yeah. You know, if you're especially it's bad news if you're selling the signature to somebody and they can't read it. Yeah. So I think too that I mean I I think I learned the lesson the pragmatically. Probably from Norman Rockwell, the way he signed his name. Yeah, it, it, it's like it's a beautiful lettering job, <laughs> yeah. and it's clearly Norman Rockwell. You know, you, it isn't like what does that mean? So you know, I think it, it, in, again, that's one pragmatic aspect. The other pragmatic aspect, when my brother and I worked together when he was alive, we would sign. We, we decided to sign our name only just our last name, Hildebrandt. And you and so it had to be block letters because it couldn't be script because whose script would it be Tim's or mine, you know? Yeah. So we just had to do a block letter to say that the two of us were signing, and then after that, I continued to sign my name a block because people could see that you know I wanted them to see that I did it. Yeah. Simple as that. It's pretty pragmatic. Yeah. You know. So that's where that comes. Sometimes so in a sketch, uh, mainly in sketches, I'll, I'll, I'll you sign, do your I'll autograph. Sign it. Yeah, autograph. Yeah. It's more like an autograph at that point. Yeah. You know, yeah, so that, you that's, know, rare, rarely, uh, you know, I see your block. Yeah, on, sometimes. On that, but it's very rare. Uh, okay, Jacob Davies says, he went to a TSO in Seattle, very cool. They had a whole song with their program artwork flashing in a giant collage. Yeah. Uh, he liked the heavy metal painting in the background, by the way. Thank yes. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was great. When I when, when that had, first had Paul O'Neill, who was a dear friend, who was the creator and the genius of the Transylvanian Orchestra, took me, we went to the concert, I think, I think it was in New York, and he wouldn't tell anybody, he made sure that nobody knows, and he brought me into the command center, and the show started, and I got to the song, and all my artwork was on the screen for the first time. It was like the first time that that had happened, and nobody told me about it, and I was like in tears. I was like, oh my God, oh Because <laughs> <laughs> it was all just flashing with the music. <laughs> right, sorry, I can't read the top line of that Atelier versus art school. Former seems former seems more intimate. How do you guys feel about artists working under a master artist to, to create one piece uh, like uh, Rodin? Uh, have you all done something like that? No, not that. No, not in a master and apprentice. Uh, no, I, I, my teaching is very limited. I, actually, I only guess I had that one time officially at Joe Cuban School for in the early eighties to mid eighties sometime. And then, and then, you know, individuals on and off. I'll give, you know. I I have a, I'm I'm very much opposed to it, right? Now I understand that's what they did a lot in it with the masters, and I know Thomas Kincaid had a production crew doing his thing. My reason for being absolutely 100% against it is um, I spent 17 years working with people with disabilities, and mm -hmm. we had very structured guidelines for working, you know. I became like you know the hands uh, for for these individuals. They would communicate yeah. uh, to me, uh, and I would apply the paint. It's a very structured, very regimented, very precise process that took a very very long time to accomplish even one brush stroke onto a canvas. Um, mm -hmm. There was always a question from people who didn't understand the process of, well. Are you interpreting what they want? Are you asking what they want? And are you interpreting it? You know, how much is yours versus uh -huh. how much is it theirs? Mm -hmm. um, 
so you know, I took it, it in the program. It was a very strict stance. Uh, of n no, if you're touching that canvas, you have no creative input whatsoever. You don't do anything until you have 100% assurity. Then even after you make the mark, you check back in. Is that exactly what you wanted? And if it wasn't, you erased it. it didn't matter if it took you a month to get there. Mm -hmm. Got yeah. rid of it. So it's a it's a different maybe different conversation. But I have a very built in thing of there's no help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? uh, I can say even when they have real news story, they never dive deep into facts. And no, they don't. That thing's condensed. It's yeah. it's, it's done for, to get between commercials. It's you know you've got a bunch of stuff that you got to get to. And I always question like who decrees that that's news today? Oh, this is news. This is not news. That's news. This isn't news. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, anyway. Sorry. In the Christmas spirit of things, gives me the quote from my all time favorite <laughs> movie <laughs> when he talks about the clawed hopper down in Griffith, Indiana, swallowing a yo yo on a bet. <laughs> and she says they write the silliest things in the newspaper, and his thing is like, that's, not, that's real news. That's not like a politics slot. <laughs> You have to say the movie. Yeah, oh, it's a Christmas story. Right. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's one of my favorites, too. It's definitely on my list of 100 greatest, my favorite <laughs> movies ever made. Ever. Like, uh, okay. Wendy Greer says, long time no see. Absolutely. Hello, Wendy. How you doing? Hi, Wendy. Uh, some person writes branded, question mark. I don't know what that's referring to. I'm sorry if we said something about being branded and they made you question that. Well, what? It says, just says branded with a question mark. I, I have no idea what that means. We don't know what that means. So if you want to elaborate a little bit, sorry, maybe it met, maybe it made sense like in the moment of the conversation. But, I got it. But neither of us get it right now. Sorry. Right. <laughs> you know. Uh, so anyway, we're getting ready to close up shop. Thank you, people, for tuning back in. Branded, a TV show. Oh, I don't know that show. Is that the name of a show? I don't know. <laughs> I don't Sorry. Know. I'm kind of Thank you for like elaborating. But again, uh, or, you know, maybe just, again, the context of what we're talking about with, the, you know, the entertainment news or something like that. Sorry. We just. <laughs> hey, here we are. At a, we're, we're flummoxed. We're flummoxed. Um, but, you know, we are a business. We're coming to the Christmas season. Uh, right now, we have an unprecedented sale going on at the Spiderweb Art Gallery where practically everything is marked down to on some form mm -hmm. or another. Um, you know, we have 10% off all original Tolkien art, 20 to 25% off other original art. Jane, what is that? 20 or 25? For what? Original art. 20%. Yeah, I already said that one. 20% uh, sales on t shirts, books, prints, posters, lithographs. You see, if it wasn't for Gene and people like Keith, I'd be in a cardboard box uh, on the street because I, I, I'm not very good at selling. They're very well, well organized. Aside from Keith, he's a great artist also, but his ability to. I got to get better. Got to get better well, at selling. Well, 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 no, but you're great at it, man. You're great. Uh, so, yeah, so a little bit of everything and special today. I'm going to step away for two seconds to come back with. <laughs> Stop. Stop. No, but Stop. I don't know if we'll be doing another show before Christmas. I hope so. But indeed, I wish everybody Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah and everything else that you may or may not celebrate. But I do. I do mean it. I'm 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 not, you know, uh, into uh, any particular religion anymore. But the the essence of, of the one that they all celebrate at this time of the year, the Christians, should be gotten back into because I don't see any of it around. Very, very, very little of it myself personally. Between people, it's it's almost like there there's more hatred in, in, in this country, particularly, than I've seen in a long time. So I mean, if you could, those who claim to be followers of Christ could get into really going back to those words and those teachings and and practicing that, you know, imitating that, that would probably make things a heck of a lot better. And I'm not like 
making anybody wrong or I'm not preaching at anybody. I, I, I hope not. I'm just saying that it's this time of the year. Let's act that way. Let's be that way. Absolutely. In the spirit of giving. In the spirit of giving? Uh, two things that I actually went, I was going to go and show. Uh, we just found, uh, or it was just brought back from storage unit in uh, Arizona. Uh, one of the original 77 Star Wars posters with the Darth Vader head remark. I was going to say, hey, we have this available, but uh, it's selling right now. And then we found another D uh, Darth Vader from the Shadows of the Empire lithograph signed by you, but it sold during the show. Ah. Sorry, that, those are going to be my awesome. Oh, those are going to be your yeah, final. Yeah. But we do have one other thing cool that we just got. We have these... Uh, Red Sonia lithographs, right? When Greg was asked to do these, um, was asked to pay a uh, homage to his original Star Wars poster. Uh, we have four uh, artist proofs of these lithographs. They're like 18 by 24. We're selling four of them. And hey, Greg, to let you know, you're going to be remarking. Oh, okay. These four. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. This is good. good. They're going to be 150 each. They're on our Square store. Uh, that's where you could find them on a Square store. You could buy them first come, first serve. There will only be four. That's it. Four that have remarks mm -hmm. by okay. Greg. I'm finding this out along with you. Yeah. So. It's exciting news, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> you get to our Square store. Check out our Instagram page uh, at Spiderweb Art. Go to the link in the bio. And that might be the easiest way for me to tell you to get to our Square store at the moment because we don't have it on our screen yet. Mm. Okay. All right. But anyway, folks, thank you again for coming back. Thank you once again, Greg. Peace. Awesome to talk to you. Great talking to you, man. Um, everybody have a great night. All right. See you next week. Yes.